Um, so I'm putting together a little talk to entertain you for 20 odd minutes about spikes because I'm obsessed with spikes, my lab's obsessed with spikes. Um, spikes being the electrical pulses and neurons sent to each other uh, in order to, to make things happen in the world. Right. So I'm so obsessed with spikes as Kay has already mentioned, right? So we've written a whole book about the things and this talk is gonna be uh, a little whistle-stop tour of some of the key points in that book as they relate, particularly as they relate to the subject we're here today for, for computational medicine. Right? So basically, I'm going to tell you four things. So we're going to start with a little recap of what spikes are, how, basically how neurons work, for those of you who, for whom A-level biology was a long time ago or didn't do it at all. And then we're going to dig into the, the meat of my title, which is about why the brain uses spikes at all. Right? So what is it that spikes bring to the brain um, that, give it, uh, that mean that it is the way that the, the neurons communicate with each other? And then we'll dig a little bit into if the brain uses spikes, what does that mean for the disorders of the brain? The fact that the spiking gives us a common language in which to, to discuss what disorders of the brain are and how, they, and how their symptoms appear. And then bring all the threads together to talk a little bit about the fact that if we're really interested in the spiking of the neurons in the brain and the fact that that's how the brain works, then we have a real big problem because there's a gap in our understanding about the human brain in that respect. So let's kick off with a little bit of... Um, a little bit of, of background on what spikes are and how they work, right? So there's you. Cool. So as I note in the book, right, spikes are, the great thing about spikes is that they are the brain's own language, right? So they are the, the way that neurons talk to each other. So your brain, which is roughly that shape, not that color, right, your brain is full of neurons, right? But about, best estimate at the moment is about 86 billion neurons in your brain, about 17 billion of them are in your cortex, so there are Many, many, many of these things. Okay. Of course, neurons pass messages to each other, and those messages are how you do anything, right? how you, um, all, your, all your actions, all your thoughts, all your deeds, words. Right. So let's start with a recap of what that message is. Right. So I'm going to do some quick adult biology for you. Parts of a neuron. Right. So key parts of a neuron. We only need to know about three today. So the body of the neuron here. That's where all the exciting stuff happens. That's where all the neuron integrates all these inputs and generates its output. Right? So that output is going to be sent down this, this cable here, the axon. Right? So that axon, that cable sticking out of the body, is what's going to transmit that spike's message to every other neuron that it connects to. And then when it connects to that neuron, where that message goes is into the dendrites, this, these things up here, this tree-like structure that sticks out the top of the neuron. That's where the message goes. Right? So it's this axon and the signal that passes down it that we're interested in. So what happens if we stick an electrode into the body of a neuron, right? That's my, that's my electrode, that's what it's like. Right, so the electrode into the body of a neuron, what do I see? So I see, I see a voltage signal, a little voltage signal bumping up and down, up and down, up and down. And if I wait long enough, at some point, I'll see something that does this. Right. So that is our spike. So that's the action potential or if you're a classic undergraduate textbooks, okay, it's a sudden jump and crash of voltage in the, that's happening inside the cell's body. And that jump and crash in voltage is the only thing that's transmitted down the axon. Right? So that speeds down here to the end to be transmitted onwards to the next neuron. Right? And it's called the spike because obviously it's kind of spike-shaped. Not only that, but also every time a given neuron sends one, whoops, Ignore that one. If they sends one, they are the same shape and size every time. Right? So we can think of this as a binary signal. It's either there or it isn't. And it's only that pulse of voltage that's sent down the axon. All those voltage fluctuations in the body are invisible to the outside world. Right? So spikes, these little pulses, are how neurons communicate. So they're created here, sent down this axon. Right? And then the neuron that's connected to, if I stick an electrode in its body, what do I see? Well, I see a voltage signal fluctuating up and down. And when that spike arrives here, we're going to see a little voltage blip in some direction, so in this case, up. So each of these little blips up and down of voltage are different spikes arriving at that neuron. And eventually, enough of them arrive that there'll be a process, they run away, and they create another spike. So, so spikes being sent down axons just are the effect of many other spikes arriving at that neuron. So a spike in motion neurons means all the neurons behind me also just send spikes to me. 
So spikes then are how neurons talk to each other, it's how everything in your brain talks to each other. Cool. So what does a neuron mean? What does a, neuron mean? What does a spike mean when it's sent? So we know a lot about this for your sensory systems and your motor systems. Right? So you can think of your, your eye as a machine for turning photons into spikes. Your ear as a machine for turning sound waves and pressure waves into spikes. Essentially, what's what they do? So the eyeball, you have photons arrive at the back of your retina, hit the rod and cone cells. There's a process of passing through two layers of cells, which transduce that information into spikes that get sent to your visual cortex. Right? So spikes in the sensory systems, they mean things that are happening outside in the world. Spikes in your motor systems, your neurons that project from your spinal cord out to your muscles everywhere, they mean the contraction of muscles. So any, every time I move my hand, there's spikes being sent from neurons in my spinal cord to the muscles in my forearm that are pinging these contraction muscles here, pinging my fingers down. Right? So spikes there uh, mean an, a, a contraction of a muscle. They mean a, a causal effect on the world itself. And then in between, the vast mass of neurons in between the sensory and motor systems, then we believe then, of course, that the spikes there mean everything else that we do. We mean decision-making, selection of actions, perception of objects, and so on. Right. So, so one reason where my lab is obsessed with spikes is because we believe that that is the fundamental level at which to understand the brain. It's what all neurons send to each other. It's what the world evokes in the brain. It's what the brain uses to have causal effects on the world. So understanding spikes is presumably uh, necessary to understand the brain. Right. So, to the meat of my, of my talk. So, why does the brain use spikes? Yeah. So a good way of answering that question is to start with the answer. Right. So the answer is that spikes let the brain send messages accurately, fast, and far. Okay. And to appreciate why that answer, we're going to have to compare spikes to the other options available to biology that can be used to send messages. Right. So we're going to compare our spikes to two other options. So we're going to compare them to simply spreading out a voltage. Right? That is, you evoke some voltage somewhere on some piece of neural tissue, right? like this, and then let it just spread down the tissue. Or something that's used everywhere in the body, just diffusing molecules. So as you know, uh, all kinds of molecules, hormones, and other proteins are pumped into your bloodstream all the time as a way of signaling the state of your body. Um, things like adrenaline obviously pumped into your body to, to stimulate various aspects of your physiology when you're aroused. So molecules diffusing is used everywhere in the body. Voltage spreading is used by neurons. We know these to transmit information down the dendrite, so we know these things exist. So why does the brain use spikes and not these things? Right. So we're going to look at three aspects of sending messages. Right. We're going to look at how accurately you can send them, how quickly you can send them, and then how far you can send them. Right. And against all three of these options. Okay. So let's start with the easy ones. So, sending stuff accurately. All right, so molecules diffusing in some space can't send stuff accurately. Right? So you've just released a bunch of molecules into some, some three-dimensional volume of fluid. Right? They can't hit a particular target. They're just going to be taken up by whatever piece of tissue has a receptor for that molecule sitting on it. So you can't do nice point-to-point -point wiring of messages. It's a broadcast everywhere. It also has pretty poor timing, so its temporal accuracy is pretty poor, because given some time delay between the release and where some molecule is, is, uh, is fairly unknown, because you have a fairly random walk between the release time and where that molecule is going to end up. So you can't time events nicely and simply from the release of molecules. Spreading voltage is a little more accurate. Right? So you can uh, hit a specific target as long as you're touching it. So the way to spread get a voltage to spread along a tissue is to have it physically in contact. So you can get it between neurons, say, by connecting them together with the protein, and there are things like that called gap junctions, but they're fairly rare. But that means that your specific targets have to be local to you. You have to be around you touching. Right? And also, again, the timing information is relatively poor. So if a voltage is evoked at some point in the tissue and it's spreading along it over time, you've got a fairly poor idea of when it was evoked because you have no idea, of, you know, have no reference of reading out when it was evoked. Right, spikes. So how accurate can spikes be? So to give you an example of that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about rat whiskers. Okay. So 
Rats whiskers are fascinating, and particularly they're fascinating to um, a friend of mine called Rasmus Peterson, who's at the University of Manchester. And his lab spends all their life studying rat whiskers. And many labs around the world study rat whiskers, and they do that because rat whiskers are a superb model for sensory systems. But it turns out that every one of these massive whiskers on the side of a rodent's face is represented by a unique set of cells in its brainstem and its thalamus and its cortex. So if I take this cell here, this, sorry, this cell, this whisker here, C3, right? then there is a group of cells in its brainstem that respond only to that whisker, a group of cells in the thalamus that respond only to that whisker, a group of cells in its cortex that respond only to that whisker. Which means if you wiggle that whisker, you can recall from those neurons and be absolutely sure that you're recording just what that whisker is telling the rest of the brain. So unlike the deep complexity of our eyeball or our ears, this is a really beautifully simple system to understand how the brain, how sensory information works. What's interesting to us is what the Peterson's lab did was they took this whisker and essentially they clamped it in a pair of very, very tiny pliers, attached those to uh, an arm, attached to a motor, and then wiggled the whisker back and forth in a random pan. And while they were doing that, they had an electrode stuck deep down here in the brainstem, and that electrode was recording from a neuron that was the first neuron to receive input from that whisker. Right? So the whisker has the follicle here, follicle sends an axon down to the brainstem, neuron, the brainstem neuron is the first one to, re to receive information from that whisker. So they're interested in here is how accurately could that neuron respond to the information from that whisker. So this whisker is wiggling about in a random pattern, and what they've seen from the neuron is they see a, a group of spikes irregularly spaced in time, something like that. Right. So, to us, fairly meaningless. But the question they were interested in was, how accurately does that neuron reproduce that pattern of spikes? Okay. So if I repeat this wiggle, randomly wiggle pattern over and over again, what do I see in, turn in the neuron? So what I see in the neuron is something like that, where the pattern seems to repeat pretty much exactly every time you do it. So the question was, how exactly? So here, one reason I'm talking about this is because here this, this, uh, the lab, this Pearson lab ran into a, a, um, an issue because the machine they were using to do the translation from the analog recording to the digital spikes was sampling at 24.4 kilohertz, so 24,400 times a second. Right? And these spikes were happening so precisely that the, the alignment of their peaks was occurring on a single time step of that sampling rate. So they had to go and buy a machine which sampled at 500 kilohertz, so 500,000 times a second, to find out that these spikes here, here, and here, these three, for example, were aligned to a precision of five microseconds, so 10 to the minus six on every repeat. So that is an absurd and probably overspecified level of accuracy in the brain. Okay. So what does that mean? So, so spikes can be highly temporally accurate, right? So they can occur, at least in this brain sense system, they can occur with up to five microsecond precisions. So vastly more precise than the other options. They don't take long to make, hence they get why they can be produced with such precision. Right? And we've already seen okay, the axon, they travel down means they can hit specific targets. You can hit whatever target you happen to be connected to. Cool. So speed. So they're accurate, what about speed? So See, molecules, right? Obviously, diffusing is in volume that's going to be very slow. So in um, neural tissue, this back, back envelope estimates put it about one micrometer per millisecond. Okay. So that's a very, very short distance per millisecond. That's the kind of distance where if you were relying on molecules diffusing from your back of your eyeball to your visual cortex to tell you there was a tiger out there hunting you, then it would take minutes for the photons from bouncing off the tiger to your eyeball to induce a message that travel from the back of your eyeball to your visual cortex, by which time you'd presumably be eaten. So this molecule's diffusing is vastly too slow for you to be able to send a message across the structure of your brain that requires any kind of rapid response. Similarly, for if you just have spreading voltage, then in neural tissue we know that's relatively slow. You go 50 micrometers per millisecond, right? So 50 times faster than molecules but still not fast enough to get a reaction in time of milliseconds, which is what we routinely have to stimulate around us, the ability to catch a ball that's thrown at us, for example. So, spikes. So presumably, obviously, I'm going to tell you that spikes are a lot faster. Right? 
but how much faster? So one example of how much faster comes from this fun little study from this Australian team where they were interested in how fast spikes get sent down um, these thick axons that run this is sciatic nerve that runs from the hip bone down to the heel bone. This is in a shrew. This is an elephant. Right. So they have the same nerve. We have the same nerve. Hip down, the heel. Okay. And what they're interested in here was, well, obviously the distance between the hip bone and the foot in the shrew is somewhat smaller than it is in an elephant. Okay. So is it that the transmission down this, this axon gets faster in the elephant because it's much bigger than in the shrew? So what they did was they found a whole bunch of animals, a bunch of, bunch of recordings of how fast it transmitted down this axon. So this is the mass of the animal down here, right? Shrew all the way down there, elephant up here. And this is how fast the spike went down the axon. And what they wanted to see is that basically this is basically a straight line. Okay? That although the shrew is many orders of magnitude lighter than an elephant, the elephant, and it's much smaller, the transmission down this nerve is basically the same whether you're a shrew or an elephant. But also, what they wanted to report was it's extremely fast for biological tissue. It's on the order of um, 70 meters per second. Right? So that, 70 meters per second, is um, 140 times faster than spreading by voltage, right? and many thousands of times faster than sending molecules. And that's for these long axons that go from the sp spinal cord down to your or hip bone, down to your feet or out to your arms, the ones that are myelinated, so covered in that fatty sheath which insulates the axon, lets it send signals really quickly. But even in cortex, with cortical neurons that don't have this fatty sheathing, you can still send action, uh, axon, uh, spikes down axons about a millimeter per millisecond, so still 20 times faster than voltage. So spikes are a much faster way of sending messages than the other options in biology. Right? What about distance? Well, that's a simple one, right? So, Unless you're a homeopath, then you know that when you put the molecules into some three-dimensional volume of liquid, they're going to disperse very quickly. And any concentration you release from a particular point is going to dilute very, very rapidly. So your ability to detect um, that molecule you've released at a given distance from where you released it is going to be almost impossible unless you release an extraordinarily high concentration. And that, that signal decays instantly as soon as you release it into that volume. So you can't send messages long distance with molecular diffusion. Voltage spreading, you can get a little bit further. Of course, as we said already, you have to have a touching membrane. Right? And the problem with voltage spreading is that voltage decays also pretty rapidly. So in a neuron, when you evoke a voltage in its membrane, then about two millimeters away from where you evoked it, you can no longer read it out because of the thermal noise and the decay of that voltage. Right? So you've, you've got a strong constraint on voltage spreading. Spikes, however, as we've already sort of touched on, spikes can be sent very, very far indeed. Right? So if a giraffe wants to move its toe, right, you've got to spend spikes about three meters from its brain to its spinal cord and about three meters from its spinal cord to its toe. Right? So spikes can be sent, same for the other one. So spikes can be sent um, meters, whereas the other transmission methods can only send them over millimeters at best. Okay? And so without spikes, you couldn't have big animals, and on big includes us, obviously, with a, you know, a, Spinal cord to my foot here being over a meter in length. So, spikes let you send stuff far. So, that then is why the brain uses spikes. Right? So, it lets them use it to send stuff accurately, send stuff quickly, send stuff far. Right? And for those of you who uh, really want to geek out on this stuff, um, so I just want to plug my own book, I'll plug this one. This is a terrific book by uh, Peter Sterling and Simon Laughlin which is dense with this kind of this detail of why the brain is designed the way it is. OK, so that's why the brain uses spikes. So there are lots of good reasons why the brain uses spikes, and we think that all these reasons, of course, are fundamental to, to our understanding about um, how the brain works. So as, a, as these spikes are then so fundamental to how the brain works, um, it's the, and it's the sense of reason then that it's errors in spiking that are common to um, so many different brain disorders. Right? So one, way we, one useful way we have of talking about comparing uh, different brain disorders from a variety of, of what seem to be different um, symptoms or indeed very different backgrounds is that ultimately they'll have to have their expression 
the effect they have on the spikes passed between neurons, because that's how we affect the world, and the world affects our brains. Yeah. So an obvious example, right, is epilepsy. So whether it's the absent seizures or convulsive seizures, epilepsy just is a disorder where uh, there are too many spikes produced in the brain. So you have waves of these, so you put the electrodes on the scalp, you can see these massive waves of electrical activity when someone's having a seizure. That's a reflection of the fact that underneath there are millions of neurons that are sending spikes more or less in synchrony when they shouldn't be. Okay. That's also why drug treatments for epilepsy tend to be GABA blockers, GABA uh, stimulators, as in, as in drugs that um, stimulate inhibitory synapses to prevent spiking activity from building up. So epilepsy is somewhat uncontroversially a disorder that's as central to it is errors in spiking. Right. In this case, um, spikes being sent too accurate, too far. So that's epilepsy. But what about all the other kinds of disorders? So we have a rough breakdown we can use of breaking brain disorders into movement disorders, into memory disorders, into thought disorders. Right. And we can uh, move from sort of fairly concrete ideas to more speculative ideas as we go across that link. So in movement disorders, it's fairly clear that errors in spiking are what drive lots of the symptoms. So an obvious one is multiple sclerosis. As multiple sclerosis, you lose that myelin fatty sheath from the axon, which means the neurons that are coming from various regions of your spinal cord, your facial nerves, are no longer able to send their spikes accurately or far reliably. And hence, you get the symptoms of multiple sclerosis or all the uh, difficulties with balance, difficulties with movement of the limbs, uh, the falls, and so on. And then obviously in Parkinson's disease, you have uh, loss of dopamine causes massive changes in the spiking in various regions of the, of the basal ganglia, in particular, the chunk of neurons at the center of the brain. And as a consequence, we get the, the symptoms of the rigidity of the inability to move and the slowness of movement, which is all a consequence of the fact that the spikes have changed in the brain. So they're no longer being sent as accurately uh, or as far as they should be. What about memory and thought? So memory and thought, Memory disorders, for example, dementias. So as far as we can tell from, particularly from animal studies, right, the recall of memory just is the passing of spikes between neurons. That just, that's what the recall of memory is. So then it stands to reason that many of the symptoms of dementias have come from the fact that the malfunctioning of neurons when they get filled with tau tangles, for example, in Alzheimer's, are, uh, come from the fact that those neurons are malfunctioning and no longer sending spikes to each other. Uh, accurately far or fast, so you're no longer getting the um, recall of memory that you would. And in thought disorders, an obvious thing I have in thought disorders is you have the um, hallucinations that are common to various forms of psychosis. Right? Perception in the brain is, again, as far as we know, just the passing of spikes between neurons. Right? So passing of spikes between neurons, for example, in your temp inferior temporal lobe up here is your object recognition. Passing of spikes between neurons in a higher area of your auditory cortex is how, you, is how you make sense of the sounds that you're hearing. So hallucinations in this account just become the passing of spikes between neurons in the absence of stimuli. Right? So they just are the passing of spikes, for example, between neurons in your auditory cortex region. It's telling you that there are sounds there which you interpret as voices or other sounds which aren't there in the outside world. Those are just the errors in spiking. But all that latter lot is really quite hypothetical, right? And it's quite hypothetical because there's a whole lot that we don't understand about spikes. And the reason we don't understand it is because for humans, and only for humans, there's a huge gap between what we know about the symptoms of disorders, right? So, you know, we know a lot about think, symptoms of memory disorders, we know a lot about changes in motor function in Parkinson's and Huntington's and Tourette's and so on. And what we know about spikes in the human brain. So we know almost nothing about spikes in the human brain because we can't recall them from the human brain. We can recall very crude prox proxies for it, but we can't record the spikes that are coming out of neurons, except in very special cases, which we can dig into in the Q&A. So that means that, for on one hand, there's a whole bunch of us like me who spend our lives looking at this level and want to really understand the brain at the level of spiking, but we're frustrated by the fact that there's this huge gap where we can't play this up to disorders because we can't get at this data from humans. So why is that important? So it's important, for example, for things like deep brain stimulation. So I'm sure many of you in this room know about deep brain stimulation, probably know more about it than me. Nonetheless, so deep brain stimulation is where we insert long electrodes into the brain with a tip 
where the contact points are is targeted at certain, typically deep brain nuclei. And the battery pack is there in the cavity of the collarbone. And what they're doing is pumping pulses of current through those contacts at the end into that brain region. Of course, if you're pumping pulses of current into, a, into an area surrounded by neurons, which all have membranes, which have voltages across them, then what you're going to do is you're going to drive those voltages up. And when you drive the voltages up, you're going to change the spiking of neurons around the deep brain stimulator. So we don't get to see that in humans, but we can see it in models. So for example, we build computational models of what happens when you turn on a deep brain stimulator. So here what you're looking at is these names here are three chunks of brain that sit inside the basal ganglia, which is a particular target for deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease. You're looking at a computational model here where every neuron is sending, a, sending spikes. Each of these tiny little dots is a spike. And each row of dots, like that one there, that's a single neuron's spiking output. So you've got hundreds of neurons here sending spikes. This is about half a, half a second. At this point, you turn on deep brain stimulator in this model, and then immediately the spiking patterns and all these structures changes. So it's a fairly uncontroversial statement that deep brain stimulation changes the patterns of spiking inside the brain. But this, is, of course, is a model that we had to resort to because we can't see these changes. We can't see this or this inside the human brain. For deep brain stimulation, a reason why we like to understand how it works is because you know, deep brain stimulation is being used for an extraordinary range of things now. So I mean, this figure is well out of date, it's from 2014. Um, but it's a, a summary of all the clinical trials using deep brain stimulation that were happening at that point. So obviously Parkinson's disease, where it was first established uh, by a, uh, a couple of decades ago. But also, uh, you've got a major depressive disorder here, OCD, you've got Alzheimer's disease. Down there, all the phase one stuff, all the really speculative stuff like Tourette's syndrome, chronic pain, bipolar disorder, addiction. So what we'd like to be able to do, of course, is to understand where this might work and where it wouldn't work, and understand what kind of setup for the stimulator you would need to best change the spiking. To know all that, we would like to know, well, what was the errors in spiking in the first place, and how does it change when we turn on the stimulator? But we don't know that, because we have no ability to record spiking across the human brain. However, however, some people are promising us that um, we may be able to do this soon. Yeah. So Neuralink being the most prominent company, there are others, of course, who are planning to create um, implants that will record, uh, record individual neurons, record spikes from individual neurons, chronically, as in constantly implanted in a human brain, and be able to transmit it wirelessly so there's no exposed, um, no exposed uh, surface for, for infection. And this kind of setup will solve this problem that we have of being able to understand the spikes in the human brain. Of course, what Neuralink and Elon Musk in particular are planning to do is put this into the healthy human brain. The whole reason Musk is funding this thing is so we can catch up with AI and provide you know, his, his solution to his paranoia about the AI apocalypse. It's to make humans as clever as AI by, by somehow not just recording from their neurons, but writing activity to them as well, which is a whole other problem. So, so what I'm trying to tell you here is a quick whistle-stop tour of a jump from quick understanding about how the reason that spikes are fundamentally how the neuron part, how the brain passes meshes among its neurons. So all neurons work with passing spikes between themselves. Those passing of spikes between neurons are how you do everything, right? So your, your thought, word, and deed. And we've recapped the really good reasons why the brain uses spikes. So, and hence, uh, we believe that understanding spikes is critical to understanding how the brain works. But then that means that there's a big gap because we don't really understand how these spikes work inside the human brain and hence how they go wrong in the human brain. And we're at the cusp now of a, an era where we could potentially draw recordings from not just the, uh, the malfunctioning human brain, but the healthy human brain too. And so now we're at a point where we have to decide how badly do we want to understand the human brain, how far do we want to advance down that road. Cool. So I shall leave you there with a little reminder that a bunch of this stuff is in the book. Cool. Thank you.
Okay. Um, so we now have some time for questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, when you said you don't, you are not able to measure the spikes. Do you know the similar spikes between two New York and three New York? Because I can imagine off which I got uh, PCG or EEG, and they show them up, but that's just a general activation, right? Right, so EEG is a measurement of a, of a very large scale electrical field generated by millions if not billions of neurons activity, yes. So we can't, yes. So there's only rare cases which you can record the actual activity of an individual neuron in the human brain. And the second one, like, out of curiosity, when you show the plot of the same speed being between, the transmission between the mouse and yeah. what's, what does the change in speed, what, why there is a change in speed between like a rat and uh, what causes? So you mean, Let's go back, shall we, to make sure we're talking about the right thing. We're talking about... So, so this? Yes. Yeah. Being flat line, I assume that, you know, since there is an increase in the, in the line, yeah. there is also an increase in the speed of the mission. No, so, so the, there's, there's a slight slope here, right? So the slope is not, is not to the power of zero. There's a tiny little slope here, but more or less, the speed of transmission in the shrew axon is basically the same as the one of the elephants. So the reason that this team was really interested in this was they wanted to see the, the sort of the limits that are placed on how big animals can get. Well, if the speed is the same, you increase by one meter the length of the animal, you increase by a proportion of one meter the duration, like how long it takes for the spike to go. To yeah, the so it's like, so, the, so the perioding becomes longer, yes. Linearly longer with the animal size. Is that you're saying? <coughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I'm explaining. But that's the So as we get bigger animal spices, oh, okay. you're talking about duration or speed? Yeah. I thought it was duration. Yeah. Yes, so exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're right. So. Because the, trans because the speed is constant, as the animal is getting bigger, it's taking longer and longer for that signal to get it. I, really, yeah. I thought it was the duration. I said the duration was the same, the speed has to increase. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah. No, 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 it's because that, I mean, that's, that's exactly, that was exactly their, their point, was that having fixed the speed, this duration gets so long that that places an upper limit on how big animals can get and still have a, a meaningful response time. So particularly land animals. Right? So you couldn't really get much bigger than an elephant or a giraffe because the response time is get so slow they couldn't respond to their own legs stumbling, for example. Hey, um, I look after some people with Lewy body dementia. Yeah. Um, and I noticed there's only one trial that has been done. Um, does it mean that people with Lewy body dementia, especially when they're hallucinating and having visual hallucinations, they're having more spikes in the occipital cortex? or they're having, because as soon as we give them medication, they become Parkinsonian in the symptoms. Right. So if you gave them risperidone, they would become, they would have Parkinson-like symptoms. Does that, does that mean the spikes are coming down? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of a good a great example of the question we'd like to answer, right? Is that, is that we can speculate, but we don't know because we can't record, we can't do that recording. So, the, I mean, a, a speculative hypothesis indeed would be that, um, yes, during the, during the, the, the hallucinations in that dimension, you, it is spikes occurring, particularly the visual hallucinations, spikes occurring exactly in the, in the visual cortex, the occipital cortex at the back here. That is um, driving the apparent appearance of uh, edges and, and lines in the world that aren't there, that are being interpreted as objects. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, They've only done one trial. It's quite interesting that that would have been an area I would have expected more trials. <laughs> well, um, so who knows? I'm not so. I mean, presumably, some of the people in this room know, know more what's happening in certain trials and deep brain stimulation than, than I do at the moment. Um, this is very old. So, th indeed, there has been, been a wave of, because of t deep brain stimulation success in Parkinson's disease, there's been a, a wave of trying it in for practically everything that um, we don't have a good treatment for. Uh, it works very well for dystonia, um, 
we have a really, it was a really lovely case study uh, last year in Nature Medicine where you have a, it worked very beautifully for a, a woman who had intractable um, major depressive disorder, but only major depressive disorder, but only after um, carefully mapping out where the electrodes should go. Uh, it's a very involved process. It took a month to, to get it to work. Um, but yes, I mean, so there are, there are innumerable disorders which we, which we probably could add to this list. I know you don't particularly like doing the animal models. Um, I mean, look, judging from your papers look, earlier, you look for more from the data. But are there animal models for Lewy body dementia? That's a good question. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going? Okay. Yes. Um, just a quick question. Do you have any data on what happens over time with age, whether these neurons over the life cycle they'll be firing the same sort of rate to work time progresses? As people get older, do they fire less often? Is there anything in terms of data? Right, that's a really good question. Yeah. So, see, most of the aging stuff that we know about, obviously, is, comes from rodents um, and, in, and animals that live even shorter than that. Um, so you, we, it's fairly well established, right, that we, we lose myelin as we age, so you have slower transmissions. So, I mean, that, that's partly why you have so many falls as you get older, is because you have, your reaction time becomes slower, um, as well as the various stiffness in your joints and your balance system is also not working. This all plays, plays together. Uh, in terms, of, in terms of sort of the number of spikes that a single neuron will send, um, I don't think we have good, a good handle on the overall activity, whether that would change. I'm not sure why it would necessarily, but certainly as we, know, we, we, we start losing a lot of neurons um, as we reach a certain age. So I have uh, a small fraction of the ones that I had when I was 18. <laughs> but, um, so, but uh, yeah, so obviously we lose spikes that way just by having neuron losing neurons. But um, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. I'm um, just <coughs> wondering if um, so how the sort of frequency and pattern of the pulses was decided or discovered for things like Parkinson's, and then if there's been much experimentation with different frequencies, different patterns. What do you mean for the deep brain stimulation? For deep brain yeah. So. Um, Right, so the, the, there has been quite a lot of experimentation. So there's been a lot of, lot of groups working on things like uh, closed loop deep brain stimulation where you um, have readout from the electrode, the sort of a rough measure of the state of the activity of the neurons. And when it reaches a particular state, in this case, a particular form of oscillation, you suddenly just turn on the stimulator um, so that you can suppress that and hopefully suppress some of the overt tremor and so on. Um, other people have played around with the regular firing patterns. The default one is to send it in a, a constant pulse at about 130 hertz, somewhere between 100 and 150. If you go much below 100, the symptoms get worse rather than better, for reasons that are not clear. Uh, the reason it's, was, it was set at that, that frequency rate is because the Benabid, who discovered deep brain stimulation, Parkinson's, well, it's got every central tremor, but worse for Parkinson's. Um, the machine he was using to do the surgery he was doing to, to destroy parts of the thalamus, so he had the electrode lowered into, into the thalamus. Um, he destroyed one side of the patient, the tremor stopped. The patient asked him to do the other side and said, well, if I do destroy both sides of your motor thalamus, you're going to lose pretty much all your motor control. So what I can try instead, I'll just put the electrode in and turn it on. So he just turned, put it in and turned it on, and the machine happened to max out at 90 hertz, so that was just enough to see an effect. And so that's how we ended up with just, uh, just over 100 hertz as the, as the rate. It, most of these things are still trial and error. Um, and partly that's why uh, machine medicine exists, is to make it not trial and error. Yeah, just a quick question out of curiosity. Um, if glia cells coexist with neurons, uh, and so I was just curious to know if you uh, have checked what's the role of glia cells, in, because I think they are also help to modulate the brain activity. Uh, so I was just curious to you know if there is any advance in, in, in research of how they coexist with uh, neurons in all of these issues. So yeah, actually, um, there has been in the last decade a, a really ramped up interest in, in the role of glial cells, astrocytes in particular, in how they, their effect on the spiking of neurons. Um, 
so essentially my core point here is that whatever changes in the brain, whatever drug we inject into it, whatever thing is released like dopamine, ultimately its effect is on how neurons spike. And that's how we see the effect in the world. So in the case of astrocytes, they do a job of cleaning up a lot of the transmitter. They also have um, calcium signals that go between them. And they kind of then affect the way that um, neurons are able to, uh, the, particularly they're able to affect how well the neurons are able to transmit to each other. Um, there's been some recent work on how they enable synaptic plasticity, so there's changes of connections between neurons, which again will affect, of course, how effective a given spike is by either making it more or less effective by changing the strength of their connection up and down. So it's becoming increasingly, yes, you know, we're growing, growing a lot more aware of how important the astrocytes are to um, regulating the activity of the brain. Yes. Mm. Um, we have time for one last question. Mark, just go, focusing on the gap that you identified between yeah. measure, being able to measure spikes and the symptoms. Uh, what's your hypothesis? Where, where, how are we going to close the gap? Is it going to be more finding better and refining the proxy for measuring it? Or do you think we've got a path to actually measuring individual spikes? So, yeah. So if I gave this talk about two years ago, I would have said that the latter, definitely trying to get out the individual spikes. But there's been some really, really cool stuff, development in fMRI recently, where there's a team from South Korea who claim, this paper in Science six months ago, who now they claim they can see a signal which is more or less the end of spikes coming out of neurons from an MRI machine. So this is still highly controversial because they don't know what the, what the signal is they're measuring. <laughs> but what they can see is that when they record it, if they give a simple stimulus, and over and over again, and the signal they're getting with their particular sequence, which I'm not know the details of, they're scanning really rapidly, of course, to pick up something. This, it's not the bold signal for those who know what that is. It's nothing like the slow oxygen signal. It's something else, something else which is um, changing the magnetic moment. Uh, that signal they can see align to the repeats of the stimulus when they average over many, many repeats. It's obviously because the signal's tiny. So now there's a lot of discussion of what well, is it? Is it just another really rapid blood signal? Or is it something? Is it just an artifact of what you've done? So if someone else replicates that, that would be wonderful. Um, but certainly the, the, the massive ramp up in the field strength of the fMRI, Nottingham is just about to take delivery of an 11 Tesla, Tesla MRI machine so we can get down to resolutions of uh, tens of tens of microns in each of the voxels you record. Um, so that's getting more exciting. Yeah, I'd still say recording actually the neurons is the easy way in terms of interpreting the data, the hard way, of course, in terms of actually getting it to work. So there's a lot of people with exciting new technology. There's a the neural dust people who've, at the ESO, just put tiny little gold particles in the brain that you can then wirelessly record from. Um, there are some stuff with ultrasound about being able to, to record the, it's almost like record the mechanical changes in the neurons from having attached stuff to them that will be picked up in the ultrasound, watching the membrane move. There's all sorts of crazy ideas out there about how to do this non-invasively in humans. Thank you, Mark. Um, so now we're going to take a break, and then we'll start with the